Well, if you have a Bible this morning, I want to ask you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah. It's kind of in the middle of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. There's some on the rows in front of you, or we will put a lot of these words on the screen for you. But this morning, we gather to celebrate the birth of Jesus, and I want to take some time this morning and examine one of the most famous Christmas verses that you are familiar with. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6, we read these words. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, would you simply remind us of that which we are all too familiar with, and that is that Jesus is the King. May our lives be shaped by who he is and what he has done. And we pray this in his name. Amen. These words are very famous because they show up on Christmas cards everywhere. In fact, it could be that some of you this year sent out a Christmas card with these very words on them. And yet, uh, if there's no putting those words in the context in which they appear, some of it is a little bit confusing. And in fact, it's the sharp contrast between the gloom and the darkness and the joy and the light that exists in the context of this passage that makes it so spectacular. I want to look at Isaiah chapter 8, verses 11 and 13, so if you still have your Bible open, look at that, and I want to show you this remarkable contrast. Isaiah 8, 11 says, For the Lord spoke thus to me. Isaiah is the prophet. He's saying, God spoke to him with his strong hand upon me, and he warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Notice in verse 12 that God commands Isaiah something. He commands him, telling him what he is not to do. He says in verse 12, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. Now, although this is set in the context of this coming invasion of Israel by the Assyrians, these words could very much be said of all of us living at the end of the year 2022. Our day is full of conspiracy theories, isn't it? In fact, it's easy for the people of God to get caught up in whatever is the latest conspiracy. And that creates an attitude of distrust, not just for the world, but for the people of God, for the church. We find ourselves suspicious of everything and everybody. Our day is full of global threats. And all you have to do is turn on the news or look at social media and you see an account of all the things that you are supposed to be afraid of in the world, whether it be terrorists or Nations run by madmen or viruses or whatever the case may be. And we live in this sense of constant anxiety all the time. Look at those words. When you call everything conspiracy like the world does and you live in dread of what frightens them, well, then what do you do? You wind up living in gloom. You wind up living in darkness just like the world does. Verse 12, God commands Isaiah telling him something else, this time what he is to do. He says, I'm sorry, verse 13, but, notice, don't do what verse 12 says, but instead do this, the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Now, only two chapters earlier in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, remember, had seen this vision of the Lord in his temple, sitting upon his throne, He was high and he was lifted up, and the seraphim, as they cried out, swarming around him, said, Holy, 
Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when Isaiah saw that, it struck fear and dread into the heart of Isaiah. So that Isaiah in verse 5 of chapter 6 cried out, Woe is me! Isaiah, in seeing the Lord, realized that the only thing that Isaiah should fear is the Lord. So when God says here in verse 13, The Lord of hosts, Him you shall fear as holy. Isaiah doesn't need anyone to explain to him what that means. God is the Lord of the armies of heaven. He commands the angels in great forces and numbers. He's like no one else. He's like nothing else. On all the earth, you can never find a single king, a single commander of a single military that could rival this Lord. He is high and he is above everything and he is to be honored as such. So in verse 12, when God says, Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. And instead in verse 13, he says, Let the Lord of the armies of heaven, let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Isaiah understood clearly the message. Isaiah's day was dark. It was gloomy. And because of that, the people didn't fear the Lord. Because they didn't fear the Lord, they didn't honor him as holy. And that creates a cycle. When you don't treat God as holy, you don't fear God. When you don't fear God, then you live in fear of everything else. The world becomes dark. The world becomes gloomy. I think the same can be said about the world we live in, can't we? It's a dark and gloomy place. If you look around at the world, you see a society that does not regard God as holy at all. In fact, most churches don't even honor the Lord as holy. Rather, he is treated as something very common. Holy means other than. It means it's not common like everything else. To say that God is holy means he is unlike anything else, anyone else. And when churches fail to honor God as holy and instead treat him as if he is like us, simply emotionally weak and prone to mistakes and errors, a God who might need to ask our forgiveness because he just didn't understand the ramifications of the decisions that he had made, well then in that sense we stop fearing him because he's not to be revered and because our society doesn't fear the Lord then we fear everyone else. We fear everything else. I think the same can be said for most Christians. We don't fear God as we should. In fact, I think pastors are responsible for a lot of this. Pastors in many settings have taught their people in their churches that God is not to be feared. Instead, they've said fear simply means uh, respected or revered. And so we revere him, we respect him, but we don't fear him. The only problem with that is, is that verse 13 says, let him be your fear. And that word fear is a Hebrew word that means terror. Terror is not something that you simply respect. It is something that strikes terror into your heart and causes, look, let him be your dread. You dread what you fear in terror. The rest of chapter 8 continues describing how this people trusts in something other than God's word. In fact, in verse 19, they wind up turning to mediums and necromancers. Those are people who consult with spirits because they don't fear the Lord. They don't honor his word, and so they turn to everything else. And it ends with the ominous words of verse 22. And they will look to the earth. Instead of looking to heaven where God is, they'll look to the earth. But behold, distress and darkness the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. You notice this gloom and darkness in Isaiah chapter 8 is the backdrop of the joy and the light that bursts onto the scene in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9 begins in verse 1 with these words, But, in light of all that very sad state of affairs, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. Verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. And what is the reason 
for all of this contrast between the gloom and the darkness of chapter 8 and the joy and the light of verse of chapter 9. What's the contrast? What's the reason? Well, the reason is given in verse 6. For, because, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Look, it is the child who was born who brings light into the darkness, who replaces the gloom of anguish with joy. The child who was born is the one who guarantees this. And who is this child? What is this child? What child is this? That's what the song says. What child is this? This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds watch and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. When the words of verse 6 appear on our Christmas cards, they rightly declare the greatness of Christ, the greatness of this child. But on their own, you have to wonder how many people have ever stopped to consider that if you just take that sentence on its own, it's actually a very awkward sentence, isn't it? I mean, it's a very awkward sentence because the sentence begins with the word for, which means because. Now, no one starts a sentence with the word because unless people understand what has been said before that. Like, because means a reason. So if you just start a sentence with because, it's really weird. If I were to just walk up to you out in the lobby this morning without any prior conversation, without any events happening around us, and you were just standing there, and I just walked up to you and said, good morning, because one of the children was a boy. You'd say, what on earth? I hope they don't let him preach this morning. He's lost his mind. Because, you see, I started in the middle of something. You would look very confused, and what you would say is you'd say, well, because what? I, uh, why were the children there? I, what, what boy are you talking about? What children? You see, read by itself on a Christmas card, this really doesn't fit the context of the verse, does it? It serves more as just a birth announcement. And a birth announcement is fine, but we would understand it a lot better and it would make more sense as a birth announcement if we would just get rid of that word for, right? And just say, to us a child is born, to us a son is given. But you see, verse 6 isn't a birth announcement, is it? Verse 6 is a reason, and that's why it begins with the words for, to us a child is born. The word because in other words, the gloom and the darkness of the world is going to be replaced by joy and light because a child has been born, a son has been given. And the reason is because of who this child is and the great power that this child possesses. He's not only a son or a child who is born, but he is also, it says, a son who is given. And those words connect this back to a previous prophecy that Isaiah made in chapter 7, verse 14, when he said, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. As a child who is born, like all other children who are born, he's simply a human. But as a son who has been given, that implies that there was an existence before his birth. Because he was given, then he's not a human in the sense that you and I would think of a human He's more than a human. He is a human being, but he shares with his humanity another nature, and that is that he is deity in flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. John 3.16 famously says, For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. Now, who did he give his only begotten son to? Well, he gave his only son to a dark and gloomy world 
so that whoever believes in the child who was born, the son who was given by the father who so loved the world, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 6 says, the government shall be upon his shoulders. And that word government is a Hebrew word that means dominion or authority. It implies complete and total sovereignty. In other words, authority will rest upon the shoulders of this child who will be born. This child who will be born, he will possess absolute sovereignty, complete authority. He will possess all control of the events of the world. Therefore, the cause of all the gloom and the darkness of the world, all of the evil of the world, all of the evil of the world, all of the gloom of the world, and all of the causes of the evil and gloom will be no match for this child because he will have unrivaled power and he will put an end to all of his enemies. Verse 6 says, And in his name we shall find who he is revealed because it says his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These four royal titles remove any doubt regarding the identity of this child and his sovereign power that he possesses. The child who was born is Wonderful Counselor, that means simply that his counsel, his plans are wonderful. It means that his understanding, his wisdom is extraordinary. This is the reason Colossians 2.3 will later say, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There is no one more wise for you to entrust your life to than him. The child who was born is Mighty God, his sovereign power and his extraordinary wisdom are because he's more than just a man. He is God in human flesh, which is why Colossians 2 will also say, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. There is no one more powerful that you can entrust your life to than to him. It says that the child who was born is everlasting father now this is a statement that has been a little bit confusing for people because they say well i thought he was the son how is he the father this is not a statement regarding trinitarian theology in any way whatsoever meaning that the father and the son are the same person and that when the son was born the father was born in bethlehem it doesn't mean that at all in the context of this royal language it's very clear in the ancient world, kings were often viewed as the father of the nation. This is a royal title. As the father is the king of the nation, he is the ultimate provider and protector of his people. And it says that this child is the everlasting father. In other words, this child is the king who will rule forever, meaning there will be no end to his provision, there will be no end to his protection. This is why the angel Gabriel told Mary in Luke chapter 1, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. He is the eternal father who provides and protects his people. There's no one, therefore, who is more caring that you could entrust your life to than to him. It says the child who was born is the prince of peace. He is the one who brings total and complete peace to the earth on every single level. This is the reason that on the night that the child was born, the angel said to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day. For to us a child is born this day, this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby 
wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased, because he is the prince of peace at birth. That means there is no one who is more forgiving that you could entrust your life to than to him. Because you see, ultimately, forgiveness is what we all need. Because it is our sin, which is rebellion. Sin is rebellion. Sin, for those of you that are not familiar with church language, maybe you've heard the word sin, and you think of sin as a mistake that you made on accident, a moral lapse in character for a moment, or judgment. It's not what sin is. Sin is rebellion against this God who is holy. God who is holy has declared that we are to be holy. And we are to obey him and glorify him with our lives. And we fail to do so for just one second. We've rebelled against him. And that rebellion is sin. And that rebellion is the cause of all of the gloom and all of the darkness that characterizes the world. You see, when God created the world, he created the world perfect. There was nothing wrong with it, and everything that he created was an absolute and complete harmony. This is why humans were present with animals that we now think of as vicious animals that would eat you. But in that moment, Adam placed his hand upon the head of the mane of the lion, and he named that lion without any fear because the world was in complete harmony. You see, that's what peace means. Peace in the Hebrew concept of shalom didn't mean peaceful feelings, that I feel at peace, but it meant true peace. It represented complete wholeness and harmony. And you see, the first man who was created, Adam, was created by God to rule over his creation. He was intended to keep this shalom, to keep this peace. And the way that he was to do that was by simply listening to God and then obeying the voice of God. But Adam and his wife Eve decided against that. They listened to the voice of the serpent and they disobeyed God. And in doing so, they destroyed the shalom or the peace that existed And when they did so, their sin plunged the world into gloom and darkness so that the world that God had created, which was a world of joy and light, was no longer a world of joy and light because God's peace was now absent because sin was present. Notice that when the fall took place, when these people rebelled against God, there was no longer peace between humans and God. Because they had disobeyed him, they had rebelled against him. That means that reconciliation must take place between them. But there's no longer peace either between humans with other humans. If you look at the world and you want to know why we lie to each other and steal from each other and cheat each other and kill each other, it's because the peace of God has been removed. The reason the world is dark and gloomy is because you don't know if you're going to be shot when you're in a dark alleyway because of someone who's experiencing too much gloom that day. But not only that, I mean, it's peace that exists between humanity and the rest of creation. Animals now want to kill you and devour you. And this world wants to create ice storms that make your car slide off the road. You see, dangerous creation was not what God had created. He created a good creation in which humans could live in harmony with it. But all of this was disrupted by the fall of man, the sin of Adam. There was also no longer peace between humans within themselves. You want to know why there's so much anxiety in the world, so much depression, so much fear? Is because our own lives could be characterized as lives of inner turmoil, in which we use the words gloominess and darkness when describing how we feel to our physicians. 
I just feel gloomy. I feel that I'm surrounded by darkness. This is the reason of suicide. See, it's this complete and total lack of peace that all is the result of sin that characterizes the world. And so how do we get out of that mess? What's the answer to that? Well, the way that complete peace between us and God and us and each other and us and the world and us within ourselves, the only way that that complete peace can be restored is if sin is dealt with. Everything else is just attempting to deal with the symptoms. Well, let me deal with my anxiety. That's a symptom. Let me deal with my bad relationship with you. That's a symptom. Let me deal with all of the things that I see that are going on with what's happening in the weather. So let's stop using hairspray. Well, that's a symptom. What about with us and God? How are you going to get right there? Well, let me try to behave. Let me try to be good. Well, that's not the answer. The only way sin can be dealt with is that sin must be atoned for. Sin must be atoned for so that we might be reconciled to God because God is the God of Isaiah 6 who is holy. This is the reason that the angel Gabriel said to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, Mary will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In other words, the child who was born, the son who was given, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And how does he save his people from their sins? By making atonement for their sins through his death on the cross. If the wood of the manger that once held him does not become the wood of the cross that he is now nailed to, there's no hope for you and me. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he took all of our sin upon himself. He was judged in our place as if he had committed every sin that you and I had ever committed, although he had never committed a single sin of his own. And that's why on the cross, Jesus was treated by God as a sinner. When God judged him, he poured out his wrath upon him. Even though he was not a sinner, and it's the reason why on the cross we can say there was no peace between him and God, just as if for sinners there's no peace between him and God. But it wasn't just God who treated him this way. God treated him as a sinner, but humans treated him as an object of disgust and ridicule. Because on the cross, there was no peace between Jesus and the rest of humanity. Because he embodied our sin, and our sin has led to a lack of peace between us and humans. Jesus experienced it himself. When Jesus hung on the cross, the sky was filled with darkness, and Jesus was filled with gloom. And the reason was because there was no peace in creation and there was no peace within himself. The Holy One of Israel, covered in sin, suffering for the sins of the world. When he breathed his last, he cried out, It is finished. It's done. What is done? 2 Corinthians 5.19 puts it so well. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Do you understand, on the cross, the gloom and the darkness of the world concentrated themselves upon the Messiah, Jesus. And there on the cross... The child who was born, the son who was given, 
exhausted them of their power, and he rendered them defeated. After his resurrection from the dead, he ascended to heaven where he was exalted at the right hand of the Father. And from there, he now rules as what? The Prince of Peace. True peace, real shalom, is found only in him. And one day he will return. And when he returns, what will he do with all of creation? He will banish the doom and the darkness and the gloom forever. And instead, the world will be a world characterized by nothing but light, his light and his joy. So the future is not a future of gloom and darkness, is it? It's a future of joy. It's a future of light. This is the reason why we as Christians never lose hope in a weary world. No matter what the world looks like, no matter how dark and gloomy it may be, we never lose hope. It's the reason why year after year, we continue to gather on Christmas to celebrate the child who was born, the son who was given, because his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, which means that in our life, we go to him and we find all of the hope that our souls long for. The future is not full of gloom and darkness, but joy and light, because John 1 says this, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In Jesus is life and light. Outside of him is nothing but death and darkness. That means you must come to him if you want life. All the other places that you're searching for, you're never going to find what you're looking for. He's the wonderful counselor. That means if you're looking for something to provide counsel for your life outside of him, you might find counsel, but it won't be wonderful. He's the mighty God. Whatever it is that you're searching for in life and whatever it is that you're seeking to fill the void of that hole that's in your heart with something that can serve as God to you, be it your children or your money or your career, your intellect, your physical abilities. It may prove for a while to function as a God for you, but it will never be mighty. All of those things will fail you at some point. He's the everlasting Father. Whatever it is you're looking for to provide for you, to protect you, it may do so for a while, but it might give out in the end because it is never everlasting as he is. Whatever you are turning to for peace, understand that that peace will be fleeting. It might last for a moment, but it may be gone tomorrow because ultimately there is only one who is the Prince of Peace. It is Jesus. You must come to him. Outside of him is nothing but gloom and darkness. This means you repent of your sins. I mean, you turn away from all of your efforts and all of your false gods. It means you turn to him in faith. You trust him. You give to him all that you are because he's already given to you all that he is. This morning, you simply call upon his name. When you call upon his name, you call upon everything that he is and you ask him to be all of those things for you. The child who was born the son who was given, his name is called wonderful. So call him that. Say wonderful counselor. His name was called mighty God. Say to Jesus this morning, you are the mighty God. His name is everlasting father. Say that to him. You, Lord Jesus, are the everlasting provider and protector of my life. Therefore, I give my life to you. His name is Prince of Peace. You say to him this morning, Jesus, I have no peace with you. Be to me the Prince of Peace. You call him these names and you call upon his name. You cry out to him for the forgiveness of sin because his name is Jesus and his name means God saves. He saves us by forgiving us of our sins. And so this morning you call him that. You call him Jesus. 
And when you worship him this morning, you move quickly from the manger and the sentimentality of the baby to the throne room of heaven where you see him seated high and lifted up, exalted and praised forever by the angels of heaven. You see him surrounded by light and you see the saints at his throne experiencing everlasting joy and you say to him, this is my future. My future is with you in the light. It's a future of joy. And you do not let the dark gloominess of the world sink that which we call Christmas into a day of despair and hopelessness when the whole day means that he is the light of the world. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much this morning for the gift of Jesus, the Messiah who was born to rescue sinners like us. We thank you that there's nothing that is beyond his reach. And I pray for people who are here this room, here in this room this morning listening to my voice who may think in their mind that their sins are too great for him. That he's capable of forgiving those who are generally for the most people moral people who've made a few mistakes and are pretty religious people because they come every Sunday but there are people that think this morning, well, it can't be me, my sins are too bad. My sins are awful. The things I've done are terrible. There's others who certainly think that the sins that have been committed against them are too terrible. They live with shame and embarrassment and they think, certainly God would never want me, I'm too dirty and unclean. This morning, Father, they are the ones I pray for the most that, Lord, you would show them that in Christ, sin has been atoned for forever. The worst sins humanity could ever contrive have been dealt with forever by Jesus on the cross. And I pray, Lord, that the joy of salvation would be the gift that they receive on this Christmas day. We praise you for your goodness and for your grace. And we thank you because when we say, unto us a child is born, a son is given, we understand that it was your son and that you are the one who gave him. And so we thank you for your great love and for giving us the greatest gift we will ever receive. And we've already received it. We pray this in the name of our King Jesus. Amen.